Hi, I'm Art Fine. Welcome to Little Art's Poker Party. Uh, coming to you from Hollywood on a beautiful day in May, 1988. Uh, Todd Everett's, we're holding this seat for Todd. He's like that, uh, there's some Jewish guy who doesn't show up at a certain holiday. The Messiah. Said, the Messiah. Todd is like the Messiah. He's, uh, he's not here right now, but we're praying that he'll make it. So I'm going to handle this one all by myself. Um, uh, we have a very special show. I have a very special show today about Gold Star Recording Studios. Um, no longer there. My guests are Larry Levine. Engineer from Gold Star, and uh, welcome, Larry. Thanks, Art. Nice, nice to, to be here. Nice to see you. And next to him, we got Stan Ross, How the owner of Gold Star. One of the owners. One of the owners. One of the owners. Uh, Dave Gold was my partner for 35 years. Okay, uh, if you don't know Gold Star, uh, I like when I came to LA in '72. The first thing I wanted to do was see Gold Star. I wanted to see the place where Phil Spector made all those records, you know, and that's the. Uh, the identity I always had with the place, because every one of Phil Spector's hits, right, every one? I mean, Be My Baby, Love and Feeling. I mean, Practically every one he did. I think the Phyllis record stuff, yeah, was all the, everything. All so the up, cut you know, stuff in, of his own in New York, but all the Phyllis records. All the Phyllis records were done there. So Uptown, as early as the first. Was the oh, first. I did the Teddy Bear stuff. Oh, and the Teddy Bears, too. Yeah. So all the Phil Spector product came out of Gold Star. No, come to think of it, Uptown was one that didn't. That was out of New York. New York. It was. Okay. okay. Uh, the crystals, the early crystal stuff was New York. Huh. So um, that, that place is, is burned in my mind as the Phil Spector place. And I used to see it on the back of the Phil Spector albums. It would, and it would list all these musicians who I wasn't never, never seen their names before. And then your name would always show up on the singles even. Now, did that like is that in lieu of payment or what's the deal? How did you? How the engineer ended up coming credited on uh, hit singles? Everything was in lieu of payment. I mean, <laughs> Phil would pay anybody anything if he could get out of it. No, actually, Phil was the first person I ever met who uh, who wanted to recognize people who contributed, and uh, he used to be adamant about that. He would get angry at producers who didn't really produce when the artist produced for the artist not getting recognition of producing the records. The one that comes to mind, of course, is the Beach Boys, uh, you know, because mm -hmm. Brian Wilson really produced all that stuff, even though they had a record company producer listed. I see. But Phil always wanted, yeah, he, so he gave everybody credit. I, uh, I'm money. grateful to him. <laughs> well, it may have been, but no, he, he paid his bills. <laughs> he always paid. Phil was one of the good pays at, at Gold Star, because he said, we needed the money. No, I, well, that's, <laughs> but he said, you never, uh, where you live, you always pay your rent. <laughs> well, Stan, uh, the, the recording studio, like I say, a lot of people's minds had burned in as the Phil Spector place, yeah. but it goes a lot before then. A lot before then. When did and you open it? It had a great history. The history of 1950, June 1950 is when Gold Star officially opened up. And we started doing demo, demo records. Uh -huh. To the public, demo records are demonstration records of songs, singers, performers, who are not signed to any commercial label. And so these records were taken around and shown to, to the record companies, the publishers, and so on. It was very exciting, because mm -hmm. you ran across raw talent, unheard of songwriters like Burt Backrack, mm -hmm. you know, unknown names. It was exciting. And we had a lot of fun, fun days. Worked with Frank Lesser doing some Broadway shows, Damn Yankees, yeah. uh, Most Happy Fella, uh, all those wonderful, great shows of the past, the early 50s. It was magnificent. So you say that it was a demo studio, so there was, it was minimal equipment at first and then it grew? That's right. We kept pouring money back into it and putting in all the equipment we could, <laughs> building equipment, buying equipment. There wasn't as much hardware available then as there is now. Yeah. We had to build a lot of it ourselves. Exactly. And that's where Dave Gold came in so handy. He was, he was just a super brain in building equipment. Hmm. Well, you know, uh, you guys are known as a big rock and roll producing studio. Uh, I think now, Summertime Blues, Eddie Co all of Eddie Co is all of Eddie Cochran stuff Eddie cut Cochran's. with you? Uh, the, the demos that Eddie Cochran cut for American Music Incorporated yeah. in the 50s, from 53, until 58, okay. 1958, were all demos that Eddie did in the at Gold Star. When they signed him to Liberty Records, he recorded the 
in some instances, the same tunes over again, but at Liberty's own studios on the Brea. I see. Uh, a good time, part of the time, they would use the demos because they were done in such a relaxed atmosphere that uh, it came off. And well, the, the commercial records didn't for some reason. Huh. Well, what about that then, if there was two studios? Was Summertime Blues done at your place? Yes. And you were the engineer on that? That's right, I was. And uh, I worked with Eddie on all of, all of the things. Unfortunately, you know, he, when he became recognized, uh, he was killed a couple of years later, so. Well, you know, that's, now what do you, do you find, I mean, I'm not a sound guy, but Summertime Blues remains this incredibly clear thing. There's something very crisp about it that stands out from everything else of that time period. Is there an explanation for that except your expertise? It was a demo. It was no, a demo. <laughs> it was, no, it was, uh, I have no idea what or why uh, those records are necessarily clear. Uh, to me, and I learned from Stan, you know, Stan was there. I came to Gold Star in 1952. You're both engineers, so to speak? Yeah, but I learned from him. Mm -hmm. I really did. I learned all the bad things and kind of wiped <laughs> them out of my mind yeah. as much as I could, but, but I did. I came in 52 when I got out of the Army. I used to hang around there in the evenings, uh, and then I became a, a gopher, and then when they got a little more client. It was our civic duty to keep them off the street. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, uh, but the concept I had about recording was that it should bring a picture to your mind listening to something. And uh, I guess maybe that has to do with the clarity. Mm -hmm. uh, I tried to, I wasn't always able to envision uh, a parameters, a, a place where this sound was coming from or how the sound should be. But that's what I always strive for, to, to have a picture of the music. See, a lot of Eddie's records, uh, even though the ones you hear about are the two big hits, the albums that came out afterwards were the demos that he had done. And it was experimental time on demos. I mean, uh, it's a coincidence that uh, he came about around the time of Elvis's son period. And they both, we both ended up using reverb, tape reverb, slap reverb on Eddie. And like on a lot of the demos we did when the old studio B, uh, we would use tape reverb because we didn't have an echo chamber. Mm -hmm. That was the Elvis sound. Huh. It's amazing. So it's like spontaneous combustion. You're saying that a lot of people around America were doing the same thing. The Eddie Cochran was happening in LA at the same time Elvis was starting to happen back east. Yeah. It's amazing. Well, uh, speaking of uh, tape innovation, now uh, you had told me about the way you created the uh, the sound on the Big Hurt, uh, Miss Tony Fisher. Can I tell the story that leads up to that? Okay. Now the the song, which I don't the, know how to Big explain it, Hurt. but it has a sound like yeah. You know, okay. Th this is going. leading up to that. Uh -huh. This was all done live at Gold Star Studio A in the year 19, well, um, 50, um, eight, yeah. nine, whatever it was. Yeah. Tony Fisher singing live with a live orchestra. 30 some odd musicians produced by a man named Wayne Shanklin who happened to write the song. Mm -hmm. And we're cutting, we, it was the innovation of Gold Star, the two track tape machine. And I had mentioned to Wayne, I was the engineer at the time, and I mentioned to Wayne we could do it on two track, putting Tony on one track and the orchestra on the other track so we can balance as necessary later on. And he said, no, no. He says, I want to hear it the way I, I'm used to mono do everything at one time on mono. I says, okay, which we did. Now, this was take 15 that came off magnificent, except in playing it back, he says, her voice is too loud. Loud? Her voice was too far in front. Mm -hmm. So it's okay, so we did take 16. Now, take 16 came along, and he, he said, that's the take, it's great. I said, you don't think she's buried too much? He said, no, nah, that's great. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, he was hitting more orchestra. Mm -hmm. Now, on a two track, we could have, you know, yeah. straightened yeah. that out. If we had gone two track, yeah. that would not have been on the record. Because he came in one day and worked with Larry and using take 16, uh, the one that the track was louder than the voice, to bring out the voice. He didn't want to go back and use any of the other ones. He liked that band track mm -hmm. and he liked that vocal performance, except she was too covered. Yeah. So with Larry, they worked together in the studio trying to bring out the, the voice, make it more dominant. So how did the wow come in? Okay, Larry. <laughs> Well, Wayne comes in and he says, listen, I, wanna, I have an idea. I want to try something. I want to double her voice. And the way to do that is to make a copy of this tape and then play both tapes simultaneously, you know, together to make a double voice sound. 
And uh, I said, well, it won't work, Wayne, in the first place. Even if you get a double voice, you're going to end up with a double band also, <laughs> orchestra, you know. Yeah. And there's no way you can keep the two tapes in sync in sync because, uh, you know, uh, audio tape did not have sprockets. So he, he said, but he's adamant, you know, he gets, uh, he Done. was a very stubborn guy. I mean, I the, if you know Wayne Shanklin or to know him was to hate him. <laughs> uh, no, actually. I love that. He was, he was very, very yeah. broad guy. A real dichotomy of a so, person. Anyway, uh, so he insisted uh, that I try it. So I made a tape copy, and uh, and then I tried to start the two together. I think after maybe the second or third attempt, I was lucky enough to start them together, and uh, they ran together for a while. And after, well, coming up to the end of the uh, or coming into the bridge is where it first happened, where they went out of phase. Mm -hmm. And so the sound just went up yep. into it and Crescendo. disappeared, <laughs> and then came back down again as it passed the null point. And to show you how aware I was of new innovations in sound, you know, my comment was, see, I told you it wouldn't, it wouldn't work. work. <laughs> and meanwhile, Wayne is falling down on the floor. He says, that's the greatest thing I ever, because <laughs> he listened to the sound. Yeah. And uh, so he said, that's great. We have to use that. Can you make it happen in different places? Uh, so I kind of figured out which tape was traveling faster than the other. And so what I did was I went back to the beginning again, and I started it a little behind. Wow. And it, I ended up making it phase in about uh, five places, and then I edited them together. <laughs> So it was just an accident. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. If they had gone two tracks, that never would have happened. Mm -hmm. um, on the Phil sessions now, I mean, uh, you guys were there. I mean, for example, and I know we don't need to name any one record. I mean, say Be My Baby. I mean, when the sound was so big, how many, how big was the studio and how many instruments were in there at one time? Oh, boy. Well, it was, the studio was 22 by... Uh, 34. By uh, 30... Yeah, Something. about 34, with a very low ceiling. Uh -huh. And so the room always sounded best when it was full of people, because that helped damp everything. Uh -huh. A few people in a studio like that would, would bounce off the ceiling. It wouldn't sound as good. But Phil, with Phil, we never had trouble filling the studio. <laughs> there were anywhere from 20 to 30 people on there, depending. If somebody came by, they were going to end up... If I delivered a pizza or something? You, yeah. yeah, you were going to end up playing... Uh, so Sonny and Cher walked in or, and he shoved them in the studio to play percussion. You know. Yeah, you, you'd be playing something in there. Uh, there were times, you, now you remember we only had 12 microphone inputs there and, and we were recording, as I say, somewhere between 20 and 30 people. And so a lot of the microphone... No. In, you would mic them in sections. You put amplifiers side by side and put them in a coat. Well, we didn't have amplifiers, so we had electric. we had no. We didn't have electric guitars. We were using a uh, rhythm guitar. He never used. Well, he did have an electric guitar, oh, but yeah, he did have electric guitar, electric bass, but there was a stand-up bass. There were drums, stand -up you know. Bass, huh? Yeah, yeah. And electric bass. Jimmy Bond played, uh, but there were three acoustic guitars, uh, two three pianos. Two or three pianos. Electric piano from Mike Curb. <laughs> and yeah, Mike Curb would bring his electric piano. Electric was this feeding into a two track then? Uh, uh, mono. mono. Into mono. mono. Yeah. We would run, actually, Larry would be, on the case, we'd be running a four track as well, separating everything, but Phil didn't no, care about the multi track. Never did. Mono. If the mono had it, that's all. Forget the Never mono. ran a four track. <laughs> the only time we ran a four track was when we overdubbed. Uh -huh. Or it would be a mono tape on a four track so we could overdub. But we didn't, when we started with Phil, we didn't have a four track. We had a three track. Yeah. Uh -huh. We didn't have a three track. We had a two track and a mono in 1961 when I first worked with Phil. Was, it, was any one Phil track took longer or you remember being more strenuous than any other? I mean, I heard about lo love and feeling lasting a long time when I was in another city hearing about such things. Uh, was that particularly longer than any other record or uh, as far as the production time that went into it? Well, with Phil, uh, uh, it was... The, as time went on, and he had this fantastic record of hits, string of hits going, each one took longer and longer because he needed to have another hit. Mm -hmm. And the pressure becomes enormous, so that 
took, so yeah, the last one, which was River Deep Mountain High, probably took the longest of all. Uh, you know, trying to come up with something. Well, the last one wasn't the last one. I'll never need more than I, I don't know what the last session was. Well, but that, the second I can tune the record, uh, I'll never need more. Than you may this. be right. You may be yeah. right. Yeah, but those but, things took a long day but, of time. Huh? But the uh, yeah, the, the one that I recall taking the longest was. Uh, but it could have been a Righteous Brothers too. But they all took a long time then. Uh, well, Stan, the studio. What was the first hit? Did you guys do the Wayward Wind there? No, but it's an interesting story, though. We could have, but we didn't. Uh, I introduced, <laughs> we were supposed to have done it. We had a studio. That's, we only that's had a Gogi Grant Gogi song Grant. in 1950s. Yeah, six and, and five. suddenly there's a valley. There was two. two uh, she came to us in 1955 uh -huh. to produce and put it on our label. We had our own record company called Starlight, and we had a group called the High Lows, mm -hmm. which was a vocal jazz group. And she wanted to be on our label at that point, and I said, no, we can't do it because we're not into pop. But I have two friends of mine, Herb Newman and Lou Bedell, who have a, a company called Era Records, that this might be the thing. They got a couple of songs that they were asking me if I knew of a singer for. Mm -hmm. So I introduced them, and they were going to book Gold Star to cut this thing. And we didn't have the space available at the time, so they went elsewhere and cut oh. the way with wind. Because I know you had a lot of Era Records connection yeah, with Gold right, Star at, right, the, at the right. front. And Gogi was my discovery, so it was a real twist of fate, as they say. So then, do you know what the, what the first hit that came out of there was? The first hit got a Gold Star in 1951 was a demo called The Happy Whistler, Don Robinson. Wow. Yeah. And he sold that to Capitol. And about two or three weeks later, it was one of those chart busters that came out suddenly, and it was like number five on the national charts. What was the first rock and roll hit? I, uh, well, you know, it's hard to say what was the first rock and roll, because back in, in them days, they didn't call them rock and roll. They called them rhythm and blues as well, R&B or, or whatever. Uh, uh, itty, I tell all the Bobby Day records I cut. Over and itty over bitty, and Rock and Robin? Yeah, Rock and Robin, Itty Bitty Pretty One, all mm -hmm. those. And we didn't have a name for it. I did a lot of stuff for Googie Renee mm -hmm. and Leon Renee, class, uh, class records. records yeah. yeah, so we didn't call them rock and roll per se. You know, it's did hard you tequila to, there? Tequila, yeah, tequila was that. And the champs were formed. I used to work with Dave Burgess by, as, a, as a songwriter. Mm -hmm. And then when he formed the group called The Champs, they came in a gold star and I arranged tequila. That was my arrangement. Wow. Because it was only, a, I was, you know, I was going for a balance. Mm -hmm. And I pointed them in, I ran tape so they could hear it back. Huh. And when I played back with a, this thing, they looked at each other like, wow, what a stroke of genius. And I said, no, it's just I want to hear the guitar and I want to hear the bass and, and pointing them. And I just pointed them in, you know, in, in four bar segments. Huh. Was La Bamba done at your studio yeah. too? So that was that, according to the movie, there was numerous takes and it took a long time to get it right. Oh, yeah, well, there's, I, all the Richie's things were done at Gold Star, except the background track on Donna. Mm -hmm. Donna was done at the office of uh, Bob Keane. He had a little studio up in, in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. And he brought Richie in to do the vocal on that. But uh, everything that Richie did, I cut uh, yeah. in the, yeah, the album. And unfortunately, another eight month life situation. Yeah, right. Uh, and I got you, babe. Uh, now, there was a, a, a mock Spectre sound. I mean, he wasn't well, there. It's, it goes on before that. Yeah. Just Us and Just For You and all these things. We did a whole bunch of Sonny uh, Caesar Cleo slash Sonny Cher because uh, right. it didn't work as Caesar Cleo. And so they became Sonny and Cher. But at the same time that Phil's producing genuine trademark Spectre sound stuff at your studio, you're also producing similar. Well, Sonny stuff. is a percussionist for Phil. Yeah. And and uh, he, he was used on. And he's a friend of Phil's, you know. And uh, I they think worked they, for they, they worked for, for Phil. Phil. But yeah. I think there was a little bad vibes at that time between the Phil because Sonny didn't want Phil to produce him. Uh -huh. uh, Sonny wanted to produce his own act, uh -huh. and I think there was a little rub between the two of them at that time. But uh, Sonny went in and he wanted more echo, more echo, more echo. And he wouldn't use it the way that Phil used it, because Phil was let, let the engineer do what he felt was right for it. And in the case of Sonny, sometimes I, I'd put the echo on the drum. Um, I'd, he'd say, take off the echo on the drum. I don't want it on the, Then it would leak <laughs> to one of the guitar mics. She has too much echo. I said, well, you got to cool the guitar. Oh, no, I want the guitar. You know, he didn't understand the technical problems that were there. But once we understood what we had, yeah. and went for the overall sound. Again, he would also listen to it monorally, huh. which was Phil's trademark. Yeah. So a lot, of, a lot of the ideas that Sonny had, he got by having worked with Phil. Mm -hmm. And that kind of gave him the, the direction to go. Well, didn't, well who's a, on well, this? Yeah. We never blocked out the studio from anyone who wanted to do yeah. 
Phil Sound. I mean, because Phil Sound was unique to Phil. You couldn't, you couldn't uh, duplicate it. I mean, Sonny thought he knew what it was all about, yeah. and he tried his best, but it's Erzatz. And, uh, you know, I mean, what Phil brings to the wall of sound, or whatever you want to call Phil's sound, it was is tasty, unique. It was tasty, it's layered. And yeah. Sonny did it all at one time, bam, you know. Nobody understood that but Phil. Huh. Oh, well, didn't uh, Brian Wilson, we had him on last week, and we were talking about the fact that he went there to try and get the Phil sound on Why the Fools, Be True to Your School. And Good Vibrations. And good Vibrations was initially recorded with you guys, too. Yeah. Well, people would come to, to Gold Star, not necessarily to uh, emulate Phil's sound. I think the, the real talented people knew that that was a sound unique to Phil. You know, Herb Alpert uh, yeah. came there with the team well, on a brass say. because because of what we were putting out with Phil, but not to emulate. Uh -huh. At the Phil. time Phil was recording, we, we don't, we'd only give Phil two or three days a week. He wanted every day. I says, no, we can't. We only have the one studio, and we have to keep it open for other people. Well, that was a little hard for him to, to live with, but he lived with it because we stuck to it. And during that period, we had Barry DeVores and coming in there for, and we, we did a thing called Rhythm of the Falling Rain by the Cascades. Uh -huh. Different sound completely than Phil, you know, and uh, Herb Alpert. Different sound than Phil at that time, too. What else did you do in the 60s there that I don't know about? I mean, there's a lot of uh, Well, Dolby Gray, you know. In crowd? In crowd, yeah. We did uh, Bobby Darren if I was a carpenter. Mm -hmm. uh, during that period, we had... Uh, Remember Robin Ward, Robin Wonderful, Wonderful Summer? Wonderful, Wonderful Summer, summer. Yeah. yeah. Then there was a record I was talking to Larry about earlier today that, that nobody ever hears of this guy. His name was Jack Ross, and he did a thing called Cinderfella. Yeah. Which we, it was a tongue blo uh, blooper, right, um, right. spoonerisms or something. Yeah. It was, and it, it sold it to, to Dot Records, and it became number two in the country. <laughs> and it must have lasted for all of maybe ten weeks. Yeah, well, you did please Mr. Custer too. Didn't yeah, you? please Mr. Custer was done by Larry and George, and we had a few engineers on that one. I mastered it, he cut it. It was a, a group, a group deal, and uh, there was a lot of records that we <laughs> did that were just a, a challenge. Uh -huh. Challenge records. Yeah, Margie did. Rayburn, we did records for ERA, we did records for uh, so, well, you, did, you did the uh, Chanson. Oh, Chanson de Mort. Art and Body Tone, yeah. yeah. Uh, you met, uh, somebody else mentioned, you did I Only Have Eyes for You by the Flamingos there? Was that? I Only Have Eyes for You by the no. Flamingos, we're not done at Gold Star. Oh, okay, oh, somebody no. else told me that, but that was wrong. No, I wish I had done that one. Yeah. I like with my, my, my Primrose mind. Lane yeah. with uh, Jerry Wall. Did, yeah, all the, the Jerry things, all the Wayne Shanklin tunes were done that way. Mm -hmm. uh, did, uh, you said you only had one studio. Did that eventually expand into two? Yeah, right. But still Studio A at Gold Star. If I was to write a book, I think if I call the book Studio A, I think all those in the industry at that period would know that the period between 1950 and 1970 probably, Studio A was the key, the key thing for it. It was the well-known studio, the acoustic echo chambers that we had designed and built. Uh, it was not electronic, it was acoustic, and the sound that it had was un unmatchable. Yeah. And we went through some numbers before we finally got to those. Yeah, but they couldn't do it. They could not duplicate them at A and M, which was a real strange situation. That's how unique they were. Well, so uh, if Herb Alpert did what, like was the Lonely Bull recorded there? No, that was the only. Uh, that album was the only things that weren't recorded. But everything after that was. Yeah. I mean, Taste of Honey and that stuff. Well, like they used our sound effects. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I don't Bullfire. think so. No, that was that was all prior to. He did that at Western. Uh -huh. And. Uh, uh, but then but I, the, the South of the Border album, we did nine albums. From that her. point on, was all done at uh, Gold Star, right? Taste the honey, oh yeah. Huh. But we used to put, you know, the, speaking of the echo chambers, we used to put people in the at the hallway. We'd put a microphone down to the other end of the hall, and put these people right at the entrance to the studio with the door open, get an echo there. Then we mm -hmm. tried building a, a small chamber above that hallway, and. Stan and Dave and I went up there and painted it with slate in this little area that was three feet by three feet. And I mean, we, we're lucky we didn't die. Trying, and it, it sounded like a slate three Did foot Did you ever sing into a tissue paper roll? And we used a, we used a bathroom. I did a, I, I did a song that I put this girl in this toilet and she's singing. And the song was entitled Well of Loneliness. I mean, it was like, it was hard not to break up when we were doing that. I think uh, we, yeah. And we finally got to these two echo chambers that Dave Gold was really responsible for. That when you walked in there... You knew it was going to work. I mean, it was scary to be in there because you felt, with the lights off, you felt 
a cavern. Mm -hmm. And it was, and you knew how great it had to be. One of my engineers proposed to his wife in that room. <laughs> uh, Gold Star, what, it got knocked down about 84 or so? Ghost, we sold Gold, the property of Gold Star Studios was sold in, the, in November, December of 1983. Uh -huh. uh, we got out of escrow, we walked out of the building J January the 5th, 1984. Uh -huh. uh, we, were f we locked up the place. During the month of January, we went through a whole, uh, we actually locked up in February 1st, I'm sorry. We locked up February the 1st of 1984. We walked out, bolted the doors, and turned the, the key over to the real estate agents. We were out of it. Mm -hmm. The fire was March. Oh, so there was a fire there afterwards. Yeah, a month later there was a fire, and uh, probably oh. somebody had broken in. Okay. Uh, Hollywood's not very, very cool, and somebody must have gotten in there with matches or whatever. Uh, we only got a minute left. I want to thank you both very much for coming down. Uh, let me ask some more then. Uh, what about the contents? What about the famous boards? Let's let's say the ones that all the Spectre stuff was done on. Is that board somewhere? Yeah, Herb, Al Herb Alpert bought, bought the board. Is it A&M in storage or they're not using an old model It's board? in storage right now. Yeah. It'll probably end up in a museum somewhere. Yeah. We, well, a lot of the Gold Star equipment we kept on fire, we kept in storage, and just only about three, four weeks ago, I finally got rid of the big console of the new studio. The, the new modern studio that we had, we finally just sold the board off. I see. Okay, well, thanks very much for coming down again. I hope to see you guys again soon. Hope you get, are you still working in the recording business? Oh, whenever they call me, sure. I'm an engineer, half, half razor blade will travel. <laughs> All right, thanks to Larry Levine, Stan Ross, and thanks to you for watching. Do I hear Chucky Weiss? Chucky Weiss ever recorded? Wait, I, I, I gave you 400 bucks a few years ago <laughs> to reserve some time. Nobody ever. And we did never that. used it. Did you use that time? Up? Nobody ever gave him any money. Money in front to save time. She loved to watch. She loved to watch.